Welcome to the second part of our two-part Graham Bradley episode of Inside Infrastructure. You'll recall in our last episode, we spoke to Graham about his earlier career and his thoughts on the energy sector in Australia from the perspective of his role as the chairman of one of Australia's big three energy companies, Energy Australia. It was a candid discussion. We felt it deserved an episode of its own. The main topics in today's discussion will see Graham wearing his Eye New South Wales hat, where he's also the chair, and it was similarly informative and revealing chat about what the role of Australia's various eye bodies should be. We'll share our thoughts after the episode, but for now, here's Graham. You've been on the board since 2013, mm-hmm. um, which is a couple of years after Infrastructure New South Wales was, was set up. Yeah. Um, I, th- I suspect it's probably hard for people who are familiar with the sector now to probably think back those five yeah. or six years and think... W- what it was like before there were the likes of infrastructure in New South Wales here, mm. but but also others around the country. Maybe you could just take us back to there. What what was project selection, project delivery like, mm. and then how has it changed in the years since? I think the genesis of infrastructure in New South Wales, which was invented uh, by the O'Farrell government back in two thousand and eleven, uh, actually resulted from there being no process. Uh, no systematic process of projects selection or identification, and in fact, it was it was a reaction to the um, failure of New South Wales to win any significant share of the ten billion dollars that the Rudd government put up for infrastructure spending in the GF during the GFC to help stimulate the economy. New South Wales was found to have a cupboard that was threadbare when it came to shovel-ready projects or a pipeline of them properly researched and planned after many, many years of a government that uh, just didn't do the planning and didn't uh, support projects. Um, So the O'Farrell government, in reaction to that failure to get a significant slice for a third of the country uh, of those monies, said, well, we don't want that to happen. Let's get a proper planning uh, process that will give us a a, a pipeline of projects so we know where we're going. Now, of course, the other motivation was that New South Wales had neglected to build infrastructure to meet social and and population needs for about a decade and a half and was well behind other states um, in in infrastructure uh, delivery. So the other reason to, to establish infrastructure in New South Wales was to uh, if you like, to um, uh, try to address that backlog uh, of expenditures. Um, when I was first uh, asked by uh, Barry O'Farrell to consider uh, succeeding Nick Griner as the chair, um, I, uh, I had some doubts about uh, joining another government board. I'd, I'd been on the Film Finance Corporation board in, in, for the federal government for six years and chaired that. and. It was mostly an enjoyable experience, but now and again, ministers would uh, intrude on the good decision-making of the board and you'd realize that you uh, could be overridden uh, and that your independence was problematic. Um, But I nevertheless, having as president of the Business Council, uh, railed at state and federal governments for failure to spend enough on infrastructure for many years. Um, I felt it, I couldn't uh, couldn't refuse to take this opportunity to make a contribution uh, to good policy in infrastructure. And the more I looked at the structure that had been created for infrastructure in New South Wales, which is still unique across the country, even though there have been other lookalike uh, bodies created in other states, um, I thought was an admirable piece of, uh, if you like, governance infrastructure for 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 government. Uh, the what, what is that? that yeah. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, let, let, me, let me give you the features of it. The, the fact that firstly, uh, a high degree of independence, so a majority of independent business people on the board, an independent chair, three heads of departments, but not departments that uh, receive infrastructure funding. So that's premiers, planning, mm-hmm. uh, and treasury. Um, so a good forum to, 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 uh, for the private sector members to interact with heads of government, policy makers. Um, a, a requirement for us to uh, uh, publish every five years publicly uh, a, a 20 year priority plan for the state infrastructure uh, with our rationale for that plan, uh, something to which the government had to publicly respond. In other words, this wasn't uh, a report that could be sat on. We had the right to publish it uh, and therefore stimulate. Uh, informed public debate about the priorities that the government was setting. In other words, putting some pressure on the government to pick the right projects or justify why they weren't. And then uh, the 
the, the structure around the, the restart fund, it, which is still unique across uh, Australia, the notion that the government would deny itself the ability to uh, use the funds generated from the sale of public infrastructure for anything they like to do with it mm-hmm. uh, and to delegate the authority over that to an independent board uh, which could say no uh, unless those funds were going to be applied to a high-value long-term infrastructure project that met a, a sensible benefit-cost ratio analysis. Uh, and that a, is a self-denying uh, uh, structure for any absolutely. political group or politicians to set up. And uh, I have to say in my six years uh, on the board, it's been highly respected by the government. It, that's uh, that, that re- The restart fund, it's something that actually we, we um, have discussed previously on in, in on this show, not specifically about restart, but whether um, these infrastructure investment decisions should be technocratic, whether these infrastructure agencies should have funding and be able to make those decisions. Um, how has it been? You, you view it as pretty successful. How has how has the rest of New South Wales government responded? I mean, Treasury, I'm guessing, is it, it wouldn't initially have been super excited about having twenty billion dollars effectively taken away from there. Uh, processes? Well, we now control $33 billion uh, of money, most of which is allocated to to projects that we have been happy to approve. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, about how well it was received when it was set up, but it was set up very deliberately to help reassure the public right. that if the government was going to sell public assets in the form of power stations, ports, poles and wires, uh, or, or, or a block of land next to the school, that there would be something to show for that money and it would not just disappear into consolidated revenue and uh, have nothing to show. And New South Wales, under the previous, under the pr- prior to the, to the O'Farrell government, had had 16 years of a government, two property booms and one resource boom, and really couldn't point to any significant major infrastructure dividend from, from those booms and the windfall that it created in terms of uh, stamp duty, taxes, and royalties. Um, so the, the, the federal government's very clear. We're not going to let that happen again. We want something to show for um, uh, for uh, intangible in public assets if we sell and recycle um, asset monies through the recycling program. And they did something else, which I think is, again, unique around the country. They said that uh, if there was a windfall gain on major taxes such as payroll tax, stamp duty, and the like, over and above the budget each year, that money would not go into consolidated revenue, but would go into the restart fund. So over the course of the last six years, we've generated about $2.5 billion into the fund from uh, the fact that we've had a property boom with high stamp duty, and we've had a now resurgent uh, coal prices that have led to high royalties, higher than budgeted royalties. So that, those were, were deliberate structures to mean that there would be something tangible to show uh, when the government gets more money than it expects. So we had Anthony Albanese on this podcast a, a couple of weeks ago, and he was um, he's very clear about his views around infrastructure Australia and that it shouldn't have control over a bucket of money. Even a, even a negative power to say government, no, you can't invest in that. Yes, and, and that will be a, a position taken by, by governments which are not committed to the same policies as New South Wales. And as I say, none of the other infrastructure bodies around the country have that same structure that we have. Um, and it's, um, but I think it's an admirable structure. And it's not that we have the power to determine. Uh, let's be clear about that. The, the, uh, the government is, the, is elected to make these decisions. It has every right to choose whatever projects it likes. Um, but it has, in this case, in a sense, delegated to us a right of veto to use certain funds for certain projects. Um, and ultimately, can, if they want to change their mind, they can go through a, se- a series of steps to unwind it. But for there's can change quite the a legislation, bit, absolutely. Right? But there's quite a bit of certainty that you have that this is um, that this is your fund to to manage to the best of for, for the economy economy of New South Wales. Yeah, we don't we don't in any way inhibit the government from undertaking any project they choose to do right. to, to build or fund, but they have to fund it from taxpayers' money, not from the recycled asset fund, uh, unless we think it's a project that's worthy of using that fund. So they're not in, the government's not 
in, prevented in any way from picking the projects it wants to to fund. And by and large, uh, in fact, the great majority of the restart fund has been allocated to projects that both the government and we think are very worthwhile, high return, significant projects that have transformed the city and many of the regional areas as well. So there, so there is no, uh, there's no inherent conflict in that. Uh, or, or indeed, does it reduce the responsibility of representatives in government? What it does do, though, is put an even sharper focus on benefit cost ratios. It does. It, that, um, that's exactly what it's meant to do, right? And in, in our, some commentators have said, well, benefit cost ratios are one tool to consider projects through. Mm -hmm. but, but this structure actually says the benefit cost ratio is a key determining factor in whether or not something is accepted by infrastructure in New South Wales and therefore as the gatekeeper to that recycled That's correct. asset yep. money. That's right. Um, doesn't that create a perverse incentive to m make the BCR look better? Well, it's part of our job if we're going to remain credible to to, to have integrity around our, our uh, approach to those analyses. We don't do it alone. We have uh, we engage with Treasury around the policies and principles that you'd apply to assessing benefits. There's always qualitative elements, um, but by and large, most of our projects don't require us to look at um, other benefits. We look at purely the economic benefits, and they usually get a tick on that basis without having to bring wider economic benefits that are more qualitative into account. But to take an example, um, we have been happy to approve the allocation of funds towards cultural assets. Uh, for example, the uh, extension of the, of the uh, Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney Modern Project. Very difficult uh, to model in a BCR sense. Very difficult to model, but we have created a methodology for doing that that looks at visitorship, it looks at um, the usage, it puts a value on the usage, it looks at uh, inter interstate uh, tourism, it looks at those factors as well. And, and can help the government to decide whether that's a better cultural uh, facility than some other that they might be uh, lobbied for. Um, so we've given the government a methodology. It's also, you know, again, Treasury has been involved in, in making sure that modelling is and that methodology is sound. Uh, and there'll always be some qualitative elements to it. But it's interesting that projects that um, meet the requirement usually meet it handsomely. Mm -hmm. right? and, it, and, and they don't just fall a, a shade you know, uh, below. Mm -hmm. It's never that close a decision, or rarely that close a decision. Probably the only cases I've seen in my six years that are in that right, right on the ballpark would be the uh, Sydney football stadium, for example. Um, and Former. The former, <laughs> now, now, now uh, beyond repair That's right. um, uh, to, be, to be rebuilt. Um, a strong case... Uh, was made for that at a BCR approximately one, uh, without exaggerated uh, assumptions about uh, increased visitorship, increased attendance, increased number of events, and so on. So that was where you had to bring some some judgment and some conservatism to bear, because if you if you exaggerate the number of events you can get that you wouldn't get otherwise, you can you can create a very high BCR. But we took very I thought very sensible and, and conservative views on what might be the improvement in a, in events and attendance and that sort of thing, and also looking at the cost effectiveness of the operation of a new stadium with better uh, facilities access, with shorter bump in times for events and so on compared to the existing one. All of those factors came in, into it, and it ends up with a BCR that looks pretty close to one. You were discussing the BCRs in the con you alluded to it in the context of uh, of the restart New South Wales fund, but there's also um, INSW's, I guess in some ways, primary function, or, or at least equal to restart New South Wales, is the assurance that you provide. Yeah. Um, I've been through some of those assurance uh, interviews myself. It's mm -hmm. it's very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, how is that? Uh, how does that go? You you effectively running these health checks on government checking on itself. Uh, can you talk us through some of the experience with that? This wasn't an original uh, purpose of uh, Infrastructure New South Wales. Our two major purposes were, the, of course, the 20-year the, uh, priority list and the, and the annual five-year priority list, so the advice on, mm -hmm. on project evaluation, and, se and secondly, just policy advice. And we've done quite a bit of work to improve government's policy, for example, most recently around contracting uh, and the reforms that have been embraced by the government there came out of work by uh, INSW. Re recommended as work that needed to be done by INSW and then mm -hmm. charged to do it. So our, our two primary roles were, 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 were the priority list and 
and the policy. But in 2015, the government uh, could see it had a huge pipeline of deliverable proje deliver projects in delivery and uh, needed uh, a a process that didn't exist in government, but certainly exists in the private sector, and that is of having external assurance around the progress and delivery, aimed at making sure that the government wasn't taken by surprise mm -hmm. uh, by unexpected delays or unexpected cost overruns and so on that could have been uh, fixed or improved by earlier intervention and knowledge. So they asked uh, Infrastructure New South Wales to develop, essentially, an assurance process. The second thing which they did at that time was to create uh, projects New South Wales and uh, make uh, INSW the project delivery authority for a limited range of highly complex interagency kind of projects such as the football stadium, such as the Walsh Bay Arts Redevelopment. Uh, and of course, our first of those projects was the redevelopment of Darling Harbour mm -hmm. and, the de and the delivery of the various facilities there. For agencies that don't do a lot of delivery regularly. This was mainly f those. mainly where the government felt that the responsible agency, in that case, the, for example, the Foreshores Authority, or in the case of the, um, the, the uh, Grafton a present prison facility where prisons haven't built a, built a jail for 30 years, uh, where uh, sports haven't built a stadium for 35 years. They felt that the agency didn't have the project management and delivery skills, so they've asked us to take on those projects as the delivery agency. We don't assure ourselves when we're the delivery agency. Treasury uh, provide an insurance process right. against our projects, so we're not reviewing our own work. Okay. Uh, but our job is to uh, keep an eye on the 600, 700 projects uh, where there's over $10 million of taxpayers' money. We obviously focus on the high profile, high risk, high cost projects. There's about 50 of those um, that get most of the attention. Uh, and our job is to do the periodic health checks and reviews using independent experts um, and to provide the government with early warning uh, and, and where we can with uh, solutions. Uh, for the problems that may be being encountered. Now, th that that could be seen by departments as uh, yet another uh, kind of Auditor General review of them, but I would, uh, I'm pleased to say the way that um, our people have conducted those uh, those reviews, they've seen as much more partners with, the, uh, with the, the, the department or the relevant delivery agency, helping them to get early warning of things they needed to address, helping them find solutions where we can, um, and and helping their ministers explain uh, the problems to uh, to their cabinets and so you're, on. You're doing so diagnoses where the we're doing to general does post mortems. Pretty much, you know, we're we're trying to get ahead of things. We're trying to anticipate where things are going off the rails and to highlight them early so the government can take corrective action. So we've 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 so far managed to do that in a way that's seen as a partnership with rather than antagonistic towards the departments. We never uh, become responsible for the delivery of the project. Um, and I suppose we would be highly criticised if there was um, uh, breakdowns or failures in the project that were uh, were not picked up uh, in our review. So we have to do them with uh, you know with a, a very close eye on on the risks associated yeah. with them. Uh, but our job is to keep the relevant ministers informed of of issues they need to address because they're the responsible parties. Um, I want to just briefly touch on the other part of infrastructure mm -hmm. New South Wales role around policy. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's been an area where uh, there's lots of eye bodies around the country. Infrastructure Australia was the first, Infrastructure New South Wales followed, and then now in, in almost mm -hmm. every state and territory and New Zealand. All of them have some sort of policy role that, mm. that they deploy. Uh, how important is that to the broader work that you do? Um, and then I'd just like to get your view on what the key reform priorities need to be over the next few years, be it New South Wales or, or nationally. Keep, mm. Keeping in mind that Adrian was the policy head at Infrastructure Australia, so he wants you to say that it's very important. <laughs> it's <very> <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't self-serving, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Look, uh, I think the policy development has been very, uh, I think, very successful um, in that, that INSW has undertaken, and I'm sure some of the policy work at Infrastructure Australia has been influential in, in moving government in the right direction. Um, it, um, it's often a case of how well the government embraces what comes out of it. Uh, to give you an early example, uh, one of the projects we did uh, when I first came onto the board was to look at how contingencies in project um, uh, funding were handled within New South Wales. 
uh, and it was we we simply got um, um, one of the big accounting firms to help us do a review of how that how things were done in the private sector versus how they were done in government, and we found a few startling things. Um, uh, often contingencies were up to fifty percent in the public sector, That's whereas luxurious. you know five <laughs> to eight percent would have been seen as the norm in the private sector. Secondly, um, almost no one ever ran out of contingency because they used to shuffle it from one project to another. Uh, so it was kind of a, a kind of a, a Slash department, fund. department wide contingency <laughs> rather than a project specific contingency. And thirdly, there was no process around the application for of the contingency. Mm. In, in other words, justifying it in terms of is it because the project has gone beyond its scope? Is it because they've been mishandled? Have you, you know, is it because uh, costs have risen unexpectedly? There was no justification for calling on the contingency. Mm. So we recommended that firstly, projects not be approved and funded until enough work had been done to reduce the necessary contingency back to closer to the 10 to 15% at most, right? In other words, spend more money up front and get from the P50 to the P90. Mm -hmm kind of project certainty around funding. Secondly, the contingency fund shouldn't be managed by the delivery agent. It should go into treasury and then they would have to apply for it and explain why they needed to draw on the contingency. So there was a discipline around it. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, it couldn't be shuffled from one project to another. Right? So there were just some pretty basic recommendations, all of them embraced by government and put in place. So that was an early kind of example of one that made a, I think was made a significant mm -hmm. impact. Um, a more recent um, one, which we know about, is the construction, uh, the, the contracting policies. Uh, those will continue to be very influential, and now they're becoming uh, adopted and, uh, and embraced right around the country uh, by other state governments who can see the merit uh, of proceeding uh, with fewer uh, uh, finalists, uh, preparedness to pay the losing bidder uh, costs in order to get uh, Know, full full commitment to to competing bids and, and 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 all those other elements. Are you are you commissioned to do that kind of thinking, or is it are yes. you free to are you free to it's kind of like the productivity commission is some is free to choose um, some of the inquiries that they hold? Well, we've highlighted the problem of uh, a big pipeline and uh, reduced resources uh, and skills within the construction industry and the contract industry uh, to government uh, at the same time as the construction industry was highlighting. Uh, its concerns about how much uh, money they were wasting, bidding for projects where they were third and fourth or fifth or sixth bidders, uh, and, and all of that was suboptimal. Uh, and so then uh, out of that emerged a brief from the government to have a look at this and to work with the industry to come up with some recommendations. So but let, let, in a sense, we, we seeded the idea, right. but we did need to get the government to get say, approval. yeah, we'd, we're happy for you to work on that. So tomorrow, if you decide that... Um you know, road pricing, mm -hmm. land tax, some other um, sometimes controversial uh, policy idea and should be explored. Mm. Um, you can't, w will you be free to, to, to go and explore that on your own? Look, we've, we've got limited resources, so we obviously can't, uh, you know, run after every policy we'd like to. In, in our most recent state infrastructure strategy, we identified uh, at least a dozen areas where policy development was necessary. Uh, in some of those, it's logical for other departments to do that work. Um, but in others, the government has said to us, yeah, we think that's a priority in the next 12 months. We'd like you to see you progress that. So I'm asking this question of Graham Bradley AM hmm. rather than any of your particular positions. What For the country or for New South Wales, what do you think the biggest reform priorities in infrastructure are over the coming years? Um, a couple of things I would say um, in New South Wales and I suspect it's the same in other states getting our planning systems right making them more efficient mm -hmm. making them more responsive to the delivery of major infrastructure sooner and cheaper than it is that's one I think one thing I would say is a major policy area the second one would be Corridor preservation. Uh, we it, it's, it's taken us several years to convince the New South Wales government to put money behind the reservation of significant corridors for future road, rail, pipeline, uh, and other infrastructure mm -hmm. in parts of the city where um, they might well have taken the view, well, that's a long way in the future. Why do we want to spend money now? 
Uh, but I think we've seen enough history in New South Wales, and I suspect it's the same in other in other growing cities and parts of the country, where the failure to have corridors preserved has meant ultimately much more expensive infrastructure was needed. A good example is the Northwest uh, Rail Metro, where uh, a lot of that uh, could have been above ground, but because uh, rights of way were sold off and buildings and communities were built, it had to be tunnelled. Mm. And that is vastly more expensive than something that's on grade. So, so who, who should pay for that? I'm, 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 and I, I mean this, uh, obviously it's a, it's a good principle, but which part of the government should the money come from to pay for corridor preservation? So because it's a, you know, should it come from a specific project that's already in the area? Because they could maybe do some preemptive things. Should it come from uh, the Department of Planning's budget? Is there some other uh, pool of money that it should be drawn from? Uh, look, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, it, it, in a way, it, it doesn't matter uh, if it's coming from government because uh, it's, money. it's uh, it, if, right. if it's cost effective to do it, and, and, and I think you can make a very good case in most cases that, that buying or preserving the land now, even if you don't acquire it, but you simply um, compensate the owners for the future uh, use of it mm -hmm. uh, and allow them to use it for the next 15 or 20 years for whatever they want, then that is a good long-term investment with a high payback. Uh, we have actually been prepared to recommend the government that we use restart funding for corridor acquisition and, and preservation because we think it has that bigger payback in the long term. So uh, governments need to think longer term about that sort of thing. So I think that's a, a national policy issue. Uh, we've seen examples. I mean, the federal government uh, bought and preserved Badgerys Creek site 25, 30 years ago, created a huge pressure on them to actually build something. Uh, and my own view is that while that will be one day a very uh, valuable piece of infrastructure, it's probably premature. Uh, and if we operated Sydney Airport uh, more efficiently and effectively within uh, the noise uh, um, envelopes and so on, than we do at the moment, we could probably uh, have deferred badgeries for another decade and thereby increased its IRR significantly. It is an interesting question though, as far as um, the the, so you, what you've mentioned about badgeries, you're saying it's a bit early. Um, there's there's differing views on do we build our um, our infrastructure into a greenfield area and then let the growth occur around it, mm -hmm. or do we serve uh, brownfield areas effectively that are that are um, that have you know already high density, mm -hmm. um, but maybe we'll have existing demand. And they're existing demand, but they might be more potentially more expensive to to tunnel under or, or whatever it is. What, what's the priority? Well, here's where I think governments have got to get the balance right between what they do and what the private sector does. Right. So I have no objection to the private sector building something way ahead of demand and having uh, having taking the risk on usage growing over right. time. But if you're using scarce taxpayers' money then you must allocate it to the highest priority, highest return, and that will often mean smaller uh, projects uh, that will get a better return sooner rather than later. I suspect and fear that governments that don't respect uh, independent advice and benefit cost ratios and that sort of allocation of scarce taxpayers' money or taxpayers' debt burdens, more precisely, uh, will we'll go ahead and build those sorts of projects prematurely um, and that is actually a destruction of national productivity. Right? We worry about productivity growth in our economy. We worry about uh, wages not increasing because we aren't getting productivity growth, and those two have to go together. But if you're spending money ahead of time when you should on major national projects that aren't yielding that rate of return or benefit the community, you're actually reducing national productivity. Uh, so it's self-defeating. So you've got, uh, you know, we've just had a, a, a whole... Um, bunch of announcements because of the, the, the recent election. Um, would you prefer that these kinds of announcements go through an agency like INSW first for, for prioritization? I absolutely would, and I've said this publicly, that um, uh, I'm only too happy to have more money uh, come from the federal government, but it should be by and large allocated to the states uh, and allow them to decide which are the priority projects that are going to yield the most benefit. To technocrats in the states, though, to, to I, I organisations or to um, to political um, to politicians, to, to governments. Well, I would I would say to the responsible 
uh, responsible government, but uh, you know, if they're sensible, they'll be informed by independent advice. Um, to take, for example, the federal government's current allocation of money to congestion busting. Uh, well, who knows more about congestion budging than, than the, the Department of Transport in New South Wales, for example, right? They have their priorities. They have their, their uh, pinch points that they'd like to remove. They have their allocation of funds and they have things that they can't do just yet. So if there's more money to come in, I would much rather they set the priorities than have someone sitting in Canberra deciding which is their favourite uh, you know, congestion choke point to, to relieve because the danger there is that'll be driven by inevitably by what electorates it's in and you know uh, other factors other than what's the highest priority. Um, so, talking of elections, there's been an election recently in New South Wales, mm. and it's resulted in changes to ministries, but in particular the machinery of government in New South Wales. And your job at Infrastructure New South Wales just got bigger. Yes. <laughs> Can you yes. Talk us through some of the changes that are coming. Yeah. Um, the government's clearly seeking to streamline uh, parts of government and um, amongst the two, uh, two authorities that they have decided to amalgamate with Infrastructure New South Wales is the responsibilities of the Barangaroo Authority. Its job has, uh, has been largely done. Uh, there's still parts of Barangaroo to be developed and there's still disputes associated with those parts, but by and large it's delivered the bulk of uh, Barangaroo you know, very successfully and I think the state has a great outcome from that. Uh, but, the, but the government has decided that Infrastructure in South Wales should take over the remaining responsibility of that authority and it will be demised. Similarly with the urban renewal projects of urban growth, uh, which itself was reformed 18 months ago with the uh, the residential land uh, part of that being uh, being split off back to the uh, to, to a landcom. Land yep. uh, so those big urban projects, uh, some of which um, are quite complex, uh, involve multiple agencies, and are exactly the kind of things that Infrastructure New South Wales has been doing uh, over the last five five years since we four or five years since we got those those briefs. Uh, they are going to be uh, transferred to Infrastructure New South Wales. So we'll be taking on uh, a bunch of new projects, uh, expanding our project capability. We'll need to take on more people to manage those projects. Uh, we'll be doing in, um, preliminary health checks on those projects to see where, what state they're in and to keep the government fully informed about uh, what we see as the outlook for the projects, what, what they can expect. It was interesting you, you said um, planning was one of the key reform priorities because mm. you're immediate past CEO Jim Betts is actually taking on the planning yes. job as, as secretary mm. there, which means you've got um, Simon Draper taking over as the Simon CEO. Simon becomes our new CEO. Uh, he's already in the job. Um, Jim is uh, already in his new job, uh, which involves both planning and industry. He's got the large cluster. Uh, but I, I'm sh I understand one of his priorities, as is the government's, is to have a thorough uh, look at how we can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the planning system. Um, which has many faults in New South Wales. Um, I've been long critical of the determination authority of planning assessment commissions, which are unaccountable to government uh, and a derogation of the, really the responsibility of responsible ministers to make final decisions around state significant projects. No other state has delegated that authority to other groups. Um, and uh, I think we've, we've made a mistake in that. Uh, and I've seen it, um, uh, interfere with uh, very sound projects. Can you well, provide some examples? Well, um, I can. Um, I'd prefer not to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the planning assessment commissions are interesting because there there was this push over a number of years for independence mm. but, and to give it back to the re local local mm, community. Mm. But it begs the question: f for what purpose are you applying independence mm. and? It actually goes to some of the eye bodies as well. Is there's a balance between independence and influence? Mm. And actually, if you're just if you're just independent and nothing else, what what value does that? Yeah, serve? and and I so I have absolutely no problem with having independent uh, reviews by independent panels that are advisory. I'd hope you don't. <laughs> it would be very that's what very we do. Awkward if I and you had a that's problem. That's exactly with what we do. But as I've <laughs> as I've uh, made clear, I hope we don't ultimately have the determination. That is the role of a responsible and elected government. Uh, and they bear the electors uh, uh, judgment at the end of the day. That's how it should be. What do you see as INSW's um, 
at least over this next term of government, what do you see as INSW's evolving role? Do you do you think you'll be taking more of a um, uh, frank and fearless kind of uh, independent position, or or are you staying more in the background, um, delivering projects, but also helping helping the the other projects in the assurance function be delivered more efficiently? What's the changes that you expect? Well, we have a huge pipeline of projects uh, in the, across the state, um, and I think our assurance role will be critical uh, over the next uh, several years. It'll be a major focus, but we are also being given a larger pipeline of projects ourselves. So mm-hmm. our ability to deliver those projects efficiently on time and so on uh, will be a major challenge for the organization. It'll be a major challenge for Simon, our new chief, chief executive. Um, and uh, and for the people that we, we bring into the organization to do that well. Uh, I don't see that as a change, but it is bigger in scale okay. than we have had. And um, at the same time, we've got the South Creek um, uh, project, which you know will be major and transformational in what comes out of it um, and uh, will impact a lot of different agencies and uh, I think will impact some major infrastructure uh, policies for the future. One, one, just to mention one of which, is the uh, notion that's come out of that plan so far that no drop of water should ever leave Western Sydney. In okay. other words, all water should be recycled. recycled. Uh, it's a scarce resource. It's highly expensive to pump it out into the septic tank of the Great, great Blue septic tank of the, of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, uh, the outfalls are not big enough. There'd be huge infrastructure costs, and there's much better, cheaper solution that's more environmentally, of course, sensible, and that is to keep all the water in Western Sydney in Western Sydney and reuse it. So there's some major policy changes like that coming out of that that kind of project. I think we'll continue to do those sorts of policy work because uh, we're, we're well set up to do that okay. with people who know how to do it. So I don't think those things are changing. I think the one thing that I hope will not change, and that is the government's respect for independent advice. Uh, we all know that uh, you can write that into legislation, but at the end of the day, it's how it's actually operated that matters. Mm-hmm. Um, but so far, um, with three successive uh, premiers that I've served under, there's been a high degree of, of respect. And of course, you don't um, command that, you have to earn it. Yeah. Uh, by the quality and independence of your advice. And I think you can expect infrastructure in New South Wales to continue to provide strong and, and fearless uh, private advice to the government, mm-hmm. as well as uh, clear-sighted public uh, advice when it comes to looking at long-term priorities. So a uh, final question for me. We, we've spoken about all sorts of different types of infrastructure. Today, you have been involved in, um, obviously, in energy, um, in pretty much every infrastructure sector with infrastructure in New South Wales, the cultural infrastructure, the stuff with Tennis Australia. What's your favourite sort of infrastructure and why? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, uh, I like it all. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I had uh, my, my greatest fun was always to build cubby houses in trees and to uh, uh, dam up the creek during the, the rains to build dams and, and see how they worked. So I've, I've loved uh, building things. Uh, all my life. But let me say this, uh, the transformational nature of our metro project in Sydney to me is one of the most exciting. Uh, I think West Connects and its extensions into the Western Harbour Tunnel and so on are dramatic and transformational. The thought that you can drive from Brisbane to Canberra with no traffic lights uh, through the centre of uh, our largest city in the country is I think a fantastic uh, achievement. Uh, and we'll, we'll be there within four or five, five, six years. Um, uh, the metro will transform Sydney for about a quarter of the population and will be the beginnings, I think, of a range of, of new metro um, investments. Uh, all of those things are fantastic. But, you know, some of the things we spend money on that are really quite transformational are much smaller. I would say the Beeline bus on the northern beaches uh, for the people who get to use that is seen as the best innovation that they've had in transport in the last 20 years. Uh, so it's sometimes the smaller projects that can um, be the most rewarding. Brilliant. Thank you very much for, for joining us, Graham. It's been, um, uh, it's been a, a great insight into all the different roles you have. So thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. So that was Graham Bradley. Ilya, what do you think? Look, having been through a few of the uh, gateway reviews that INSW runs, I can confidently say that he's, you know, he's very much on the money when he explains the significance of INSW 
as an organization and its impact on projects here. Um, the best way I think I can demonstrate it is to look at a jurisdiction where that that independent advisory role doesn't seem to exist. There's an example that's become a bit of an international laughing stock, the new, uh, the new airport in Berlin, which was supposed to open in 2011 and still isn't ready. Uh, you can read all about it. All the information is available publicly. It's become pretty famous now, but there was no, no natural disaster. No one ran out of money. It was just horrifically managed from the first day. And it's safe to say that if they had an INSW type of organization there, um, the problems could have either have been identified or, um, or or maybe even completely avoided. Um, so it's uh, yeah, there's 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 a clear value argument to the role that INSW plays. So in that respect, what Graham said about corporate governance being the chief contribution across his various roles, and and he spoke about it in depth across the two podcasts. Uh, there, that's an incredibly important feature of the value he brings. Absolutely, absolutely, and so you can see the consistency of, um, even though he's he's not uh, a, a, an expert in just one of the the sectors that he works in, you can see the consistency of value um, in the various roles and and why they keep putting him on the various boards. Well, that's it for our two-part episode with special guest Graham Bradley. Special thanks go to Graham for joining us on the show, and thanks to Ilya for hosting with me. Inside Infrastructure is an Infrastructure Partnerships Australia podcast sponsored by PwC Australia, hosted by Adrian Dwyer and Ilya Zak. The show is produced by TAG, PwC Australia's media agency. This episode was produced by Adam Stevens, with research for the episode done by Yosra Alawadi, Linda Bergeson and Mitch Dudley. You can subscribe to future episodes of the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google or wherever you get your podcasts.